Dear friends, we are gathered here today in the memory of our dear Zarina, who passed away on 25th April, who I feel now has merged into the blinding light. Before we start, I would request all of you to observe a minute silence in her memory. Thank you. She was just not an artist my gallery represented, but to me, she was a very dear friend, a mentor, a confidant. When I look at very large historical exposition, which uh, Kiranada Museum has now uh, hosted, I actually feel such an emotional connect with her. I feel I'm, I've been a co-traveler with her last uh, 20, uh, two decades. Today's conversation is not so much about Zarina as an artist, it is more about her as a person. But with her, it's actually, it's, it's a little hard because both have been very interwoven her work, her art. Most of her art, most of her art we see actually is alive. So it is inevitable that while we speak of her work, of her life, her art automatically comes in and we have a little bit of a deeper understanding of it. We have here with us two speakers, Ram, Ram Rahman and Kalidas, who have known Zarina for the past, uh, I think since the 70s. This was, uh, um, and we have Rubina Karoreya, the director and chief curator KNNA, who has followed Zarina's practice since 2000, when she assisted the artist during her uh, very large exhibition at the Mills College, California. And she has, curated the ongoing exhibition at the KNMA, Zarina, A Life in Nine Lines. It is so difficult for me sometimes to, when people see to speak about Zarina, my relationship with her, because the, the memories that have been flooding, when, you know, my interactions with her. I would like to share with you first that how I first came in touch with her work. Um, in 1996, uh, 96, Seven, we had a mini print show, but 1996, I chanced upon her work when uh, Anupam Sood, who curated my, this large exhibition, had her work in the show. I had really had no idea about Zarina or her books. The works come in, the crates were opened, and there I see this fabulous Zen-like packing and this Zen-like work. I just fell in love with her work. That work was uh, Road Lines, which is still very um, sought after by a lot of collectors. That uh, work, and I called her up. I said, I want to have your show because as a gallerist, I always responded to minimalism, abstraction, and she laughed and, you know, we both didn't know each other. She spoke to Krishna Reddy, who I was already showing about me. And when she came to Delhi, I think it was the late 90s and uh, with her friend, Joyce, and uh, we met up in Delhi and she decided to show with us. So the first show we had of Zarina in Espas was in 2000 um, and she showed that very, very famous work of hers, the most important work of hers, Home is a Foreign Piece. She had just done it in 1999. She had broken it into six sets and um, a few more works we showed with, with, with that uh, series. I had, that time I told her, I said, look, I do not know because India is not ready for this kind of a minimalism or the buyer, the market but I will still show the work because I love it. And none of you will believe it that I sold the show two or three times. She also was very happy. And my journey with her started from 2000. There were 
there was no looking back to it. I'm so flooded with my memories of her, of my interactions with her over the past few years. I would annually visit her in a studio. And every time we would speak of so many subjects, we spoke of, she would speak to me so much about her memories, her growing up memories, her Aligarh day, a very special relationship with her father. And you know, like also the difficulty she faced when she went to New York as a woman of the feminist movement, she had joined so many memories and also about world politics, her concern about the refugee, refugees, which again used to be so interwoven in the last few years was more political her work. Some of my most vivid memories are with the hours that I spent with her in a studio. Every show of hers, I would go and visit her and we would select works together. And for every work, we used to have such long conversations because she used to be so eloquent. I used to get absolutely kind of my knowledge, and my whole thing was getting enriched. I remember when I had gone to select works for this um, exhibition recent uh, it was the show was titled Recent Works. Every show she used to title, and it was uh, in 2011. I think uh, went in 2010, and this fabulous work, which is um, there again. I think she did a four or five of them. The blinding light that was spread on her bed, and this actually blinded me. Blinded me into silence. Into I, and when she started speaking about about this whole work, that actually. The whole room was resonating with spiritual energy. Everything for me became silent. I, at that time, I, I was arguing with her, why are you using so much of gold? You'll be criticized as, you know, when you are doing black and white, and, you know, using, because that whole show had a lot of gold in it. And I remember her telling me about Noor. She said that I am now of an age when I started looking into my Noor, into my soul, the dark side and the bright side of my soul. Every human being has a soul, which is very, very bright. And, um, and, and, you know, she was showing me that beautiful work, Noor, which the bulbs were made in Pakistan and how she gilded them in, um, you know, in New York. And I'm so proud to say that that Noor is sitting with me and I see her Noor every day in my house, in my collection. Another very vivid memory of, of, my, of, of mine, of hers, is that I was standing in a kitchen while she was taking out a few works, she said, I'll show you some works which are, you know, I did in the late 70s and in the 80s. I think Ram is very aware of those works. Um, and she started taking out her cast paper works. And I looked at, at them and I said, wow, Zarina Ji, I think we should have a show. She said, do you think they are good to show? This was a humility and a simplicity. And I said, of course. And that is right. this, sorry, I'm interrupting. This was one of the, the first show I had in the Delhi where you see Arpita, Geeti, Geeti Sen, Jatin Das in the background and uh, Zarina. So that's how the cast paper show, which was called the Paper House, um, happened. And both Zarina and I didn't know that it would be a turning point, that show in her career, to make her so popular, for, even with all the museums. Allegra Pacenti, who was working as a curator in uh, Hammer Museum, she was in Delhi and my friend Javed Abdullah said to her, go and see the show. It's a show which is not worth see, uh, missing. She came to the, my gallery and she fell in love with, the, with, with her work. She didn't know who Zarina was, all about her work. And she went uh, back and researched and uh, she uh, proposed to the museum and they did her show, I think, in 2013. And that was her journey which went then in, I think, 2014, it went to Chicago and, and then to Guggenheim. And her journey was like, and I remember Holland Carter writing and saying, welcome, welcome home, uh, Zarina in New York uh, Times. So that's how, you know, you never know. And I would say that this is what globalization, um, globalization is. I also would like to, you know, this whole, this outpouring of tribute past week from so many admirers from all across the world fellow artists, gallerists, writers, and journalists, art historians, directors, art direct, um, directors of museums, all giving us such rich tributes. This shows that how many lives and souls to touch with a minimalist art, the universality of a thing, home migration and identity. She, in many ways, I think, was not, just not beyond the stars, but also beyond the narrow boundaries of nationhood, territories, religion. And as 
Kalidas very rightly said when she, he pointed out in his tribute article, the Indian, the only, the art, Indian artist who achieved the most international acclaim. We knew this, but it's touching to, for us as friends to read such accounts. <clears throat> Um, I also would like to share with you Zarina as a person with, an, or as, a, as an artist with all her gallerists. She was very, very firm with, with, with her galleries. My relationship with her was sometimes as a gallerist and as an artist who, and we bonded very, very well. But we, like all relationships, we had our ups and downs in our, uh, our, our relationship. But she was very honest honest, fair, loyal to all her three gallerists. She had three galleries, and she still has three galleries in the world who work with her and know, and her commitment. And I think this is a very good lesson for the younger artists to learn from her. Her commitment to her galleries was absolute. While she was very, very firm with her term, with her prices, and, and she was very particular about display and presentation, she was also concerned about her galleries doing, with her work, uh, gaining commercially. Like she was always concerned about me as, you know, whether I am gaining or not. But at the same time, nobody could, nobody in the world could convince her to reduce her prices or to increase her prices. It was all her. She was so sure about her, her framing her. You know, she was very, very particular about it. And, and what was wonderful, which I learned from her, and I give this, and I tell this to so many artists, of my artists at least. She would always tell me, Renu, I never let any work from my studio, bad work of my, uh, get out from my studio, which I think is not up to the mark, uh, even if it is for a group show or even if it is for a charity show. So, you know, you see, and the largest of hers, of, like she, I, I don't remember the title of the work, but uh, Ram had shown that work in one of his uh, Samad shows in Chicago. He was so generous, he was so considerate that uh, Bahadur in my gallery, she, he had helped her in doing that work in the gallery when she was uh, she was with me for one of the shows. And that work, she acknowledged Bahadur and I was telling her, she said, he said, she said to me, but he helped me, so I have to acknowledge him. So, you know, when, uh, when she was not well or when they heard her news, every person in my, in my team really cried for her. She would not forget anybody. And the most beautiful quality of hers was that her support to me I'll, I'll never ever forget her, uh, forget her extraordinary support and her you know, consideration. It was in 2013 at the Armory Fair where I was shown and I couldn't go because I had met with a very, very bad accident. And she was standing before the opening, uh, before the opening day, making sure that the booth is set up. I had three artists, Chitra Ganesh and Reena Banerjee and Bhutanaji. And she was there and she was assuring me from there that don't worry, I'm looking after it which artists would really do for her galleries like that. So that was my, my relationship with her, of her, of her, 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 her bonding, her, her concern, and even like to share with me every, for every title I would ask her, like for Folding House, I asked, I said, why are you putting this title? And she said to me, it is time for me to fold, fold my, my, my life, my house. And that's what I'm looking at. In that particular work, when there was one a Chinese collector, Folding House, Pekita Nata Museum has in their collection, there was 50 more. I mean, she was so particular. I, there was this Chinese collector who wanted to buy the rest of it and um, she refused. She said, I will not sell to any Chinese museum uh, for humanity, for humanitarian uh, term, humanitarian reason. That was her, uh, you know, her old commitment. She was so sure of her work. I do remember asking her and I would, you know, in the early 2000s, I would tell her every artist in, from India is going to the museum. They go meeting the directors and they're meeting so-and-so. Why don't you call them? Why don't you show them? You know, she would always tell me, she says, why should I let my work speak on its own? Let them come when they want to come. The world will come. And actually that's what, ha that's what happened. I was so happy when all her 20 pin drawings went to Guggenheim. You know, she showed them to me and I showed them in one uh, small design fair here. And the, 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 I think I showed six of them and there were 20 more left. And I wanted to have a show of those, but she said, Reno, leave them. I want to give them to some uh, public institutions. Now coming back to 
shows like even when I, the last show we had in the gallery was in 2018 that was weaving darkness and silence and in 2017 i had gone to see her uh, to see all these works to select them and i said to her i said why are you so why are you why is it so dark this title of yours and and she said to me because i'm in a dark mood because of politics and just before that i had shown her a beautiful wall of her works at the india art fair and she spoke so much about the plight of refugees especially the rohingyas in the, at the amri show also it was all about rohingya refugees camps their feelings like she would say like you know they're sitting in the boat and i wonder what how they feel going in the darkness to an unknown destination you know that was her uh, whole um, oneness with people her whole you know this whole universal love that would come out her angst her pain and this whole islamophobia which was happening in the world really pained her so much with this i think i'll i would now request my speakers first i would ask ram who's a photographer who has been with her who was with her in the 70s when he moved and azarina also had moved to new york um they shared he shared his, her artistic practice and her journey and they worked together ram could you let, share with us your memories of that time and her art practice that time in new york sure thank you renu um and i'm uh, very pleased that we're doing this in zarina's memory uh can you all hear me yes yeah okay i thought what i would do is actually put um, zarina's work in a bit of context of the time particularly in new york in the mid 70s when she had just moved there and i was a student at yale in new haven and i um, used to go down to visit zarina and um me see i'm trying to set up my slide show she had uh, just got her little loft which was actually in an industrial building which was a fur fur in the fur district on 29th street and it was illegal you know we all used to live in illegal spaces yeah <clears throat> there were a number of artists who had moved into that building and um Oh, nice. at that time in the mid 70s artists in soho in tribeca and later down on south street where i found a loft were all living in these illegal spaces which which got legalized slowly but i thought you know it's important to understand a little bit of background of zarina who was born in 1937 uh her father was a professor of history at aligarh muslim university Sheikh Abdul Rashid so she was actually Zarina uh, Rashid <clears throat> and she came out of this very unusual atmosphere of Aligarh Muslim University which produced a remarkable number of women uh, who were extremely self uh, expressive became writers became scientists Uh, her father was a teacher of the great historian Irf Irfan Habib uh, who's known for his work on Mughal India and um, she studied mathematics which was also you know very unusual for uh, particularly for a woman at that time she married Saad Hashmi who had uh, uh, just entered the Indian foreign service in 1958 and it's a uh, uh, you know her, her sister and family had moved to karachi uh, during partition but she and her father had come back to aligarh at that time and of course uh, kali etc talk a bit about that trauma of partition and how it it formed you know her whole life experience her, when her father retired he moved to live with her sister in karachi so in a sense 
Zarina kind of lost that root of hers in uh, Aligarh. Over a long travel, going through Paris, uh, Tokyo, Brussels, she lands up in New York, uh, where Saad was in the UN, posted in the in the United Nations. But she and he were already, you know, uh, separating because she couldn't uh, really deal with the diplomatic life. She was an independent woman, had started printmaking on her own in Japan, in Paris, under Stanley William Hayter at Atelier 17. So when I met her, you know, I really got to know her. We'd known, my parents had known her in the 70s. I had seen her show at Gallery Chanakya, etc., in 1970. Um, but when I got, I really got to know her in about 1975, 76. And we used to go in, I used to come down from New Haven and we would go and see all the new movies uh, like Fassbinder or Fellini or uh, Parajan of Tarkovsky. She was a great movie buff and also somebody who read extensively in English, in Urdu and in French. And oddly, the apartment that she lived in with Saad in Paris, uh, after they moved out, that apartment was where Bernardo Bertolucci filmed uh, his sensational film, Last Tango in Paris. Okay, this is, uh, this is 1977. Sorry, I didn't know you could see it. Uh, this is, you know, as I told you, we, all, we were all looking for these spaces and studios, and this is one of the last areas in New York on South Street where I found this raw loft. And you see me in the front, and just behind me is Zarina, and the woman with very puffy, big hair behind is Judy Reddy. On the left is Krishna Reddy, printmaker, and behind Zarina is my mother, Indrani, the dancer. And this is just showing you the kind of, uh, 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 you know, the kind of material situation that we were in, it was a loft which, hadn't been built, we built it with our hands, as did Zarina in her own uh, space. These are from a catalog that uh, Renu Modi had published. These are very early pictures, which I took in 1981 in Zarina's studio when she had started making this cast paperwork. And walking on her street, those were the days in New York when we would pick up material from the street to build our lofts with. I found this big plywood uh, uh, kind of sink. I mean, it was like a box and carried it up to her loft. And she made it into a sink by adding a drain and uh, waterproofing it. And that's what she used to make these glass paper pieces in. Now, how she did this is we would go shopping in Canal Street. At that time, Canal Street had these amazing shops of, of plastic, of rubber, and all those little indents that you see in the cast paper with these little pieces of plastic that she realized she could use and build a, um, a mold to do this architectural work. And you know, her work, people say her work was abstract, but actually her work was never abstract. It was minimal, but it always had a reference uh, to a text, a poem, to architecture, and because of her mathematics, she was very fascinated by structure, by rhythm, by um, proportions in mathematics, proportions in architectural space. Uh, and her map work also came out of this very unusual thing which she had done when she was in Delhi in the, in the 70s, was she joined the gliding club. And she used to fly gliders over the city of Delhi if those people any of you who are of that age remember those gliders uh, going over town. New York, there was a wonderful set of artists, Krishna Reddy, uh, this is Meli Gobhai and Zarina, and that's my mother. I'd introduced Meli to this group of artists in New York. There was terrific camaraderie. At the same time, Zarina had uh, joined um, a group of feminist artists in Soho. Uh, there were a couple galleries. She, she edited Heresy's magazine. She had learned how to design and do paste up. 
it actually helped us later on when we had no money. I would get her paste up jobs uh, in design studios working for six, seven dollars an hour. This was the kind of struggle that we all went through at the time. But she was always very, very focused uh, on her work. At Heresies, she was uh, involved with, uh, uh, let me see. With the AIR gallery, with Soho 20, I used to do uh, exhibition design, uh, art, poster design and invitation cards for them. She curated a show with Anna Mandieta and Kazuko in 1980 at AIR Gallery, which was, you know, part of the whole feminist movement happening in Soho at the time. There was a group, there were, you know, white American women, Asian women, African women who were kind of outside the mainstream New York art world, uh, and also men, of course, and a lot of them used to gather around Krishna Reddy's law, uh, Bob Blackburn, great uh, printmaker, at whose the workshop uh, Zarina had also uh, worked and taught. Uh, and these two pictures I'm showing you are for a catalog that I'd done for Bodhi Gallery in 2005. On the left is a wonderful portrait done by the great photographer Shunil Jana, which was done in the 70s in Delhi. And she wanted a current portrait of hers in a way to reflect uh, Jana's portrait. And I had just shown Jana's work in New York at he had met him after many years. So the portrait you see on the right, which has been used a lot in the last two weeks as uh, in her obituaries, was made in reference to the Jana work. And I'll show you the last image, which was done in 2005 in Krishna Reddy's loft uh, with Tayyab and Sakina Mehta. Tayyab had come for his great uh, uh, mega painting sale at Christie's, which was something, you know, quite unusual for him because uh, here was a simple artist who had sold work for not a lot of money. And he comes to Christie's and gets painted for this painting that he sells for a huge amount of money, million something. And at that same show, Darina's first work came out in Christie's uh, for 10000 or $12,000. But it kind of made a benchmark for her and I told her that she needed to do it because she needed to make money. So this was a kind of, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I think I'll end here. And as we talk, I can fill in a little more about the times. Uh, but watching the journey from those days of $6 an hour to where she ended up in, the, in MoMA and in the Guggenheim and Art Institute of Chicago, was actually wonderful to see how an artist <laughs> coming out of New York, which was such a competitive city. So many artists just don't make it. They spend their whole lives there. But Zarina really got recognized for the power of her art, which was so precise and so minimal and so beautiful. Hand over to you, Kali. Uh, thank you, Ram. Um, as Ram just said, uh, and Reno did too, we, uh, Zarina and I went back to my childhood youth and uh, to the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and uh, um, she, um, she had just come back from, I think, Bonn, if I remember correctly. And um, she was uh, meeting people in Delhi and uh, uh, her husband, Saad, uh, bought a painting of my father's. Uh, uh, and uh, that was also the time when Zarina showed in a gallery called Gallery Chanakya, run by Shami and Mini uh, It was a new gallery. It had just opened uh, maybe a year ago. And uh, I think it, the first show that Zarina had with them would have been late 60s, 68, 69, and then in the 70s. Uh, I think I have, this picture, I think, is from 70, 1970, from an opening of hers. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, the, the next picture, please. From the same show, we have another picture. 
uh, can we have the Laila Tayyabi picture, picture please? Uh, anyway, so there's another picture from the same exhibition uh, where you see her with, uh, with Laila Tayyabji, uh, who remained a constant friend. Uh, Zarina, even at that time, um, and this was before she went to Japan, uh, even at that time was quite minimal. I mean, she did uh, prints of rubbings of wood, uh, mostly, and other natural material. As, um, uh, you know, today we use the word found object and, and the use of it in, uh, in contemporary art. But Zarina was also finding objects and rubbing, making rubbings of them in, in her... Uh, uh, in her wood prints, in her uh, etchings, um, and uh, she was always quite ahead of her time. Uh, even then, her uh, uh, her work was minimal. And uh, then um, she went away to New York, um, and uh, but she would return every second or third year, and she would always return with works. I mean, she never stopped showing in India. So, um, uh, you can see her work there, you know, I mean, it's bits of plywood assembled together and then rubbed on paper. Um, uh, and how beautifully young they all look. Um, every, every two or three years, she would return from New York or wherever she was. Uh, with a show, and uh, with every show she made impact. Um, her, uh, her stock amongst her peers, amongst um, artists senior to her, um, and artists her age, uh, even young boys like me, was, uh, was huge. I mean, she, she was a very friendly person, she was a very articulate person, uh, and she, um, uh, her, her work was absolutely, uh, absolutely, uh, Fantastic. Now we come to her, um, uh, come to a work which, uh, as uh, Renu alluded to in the last 10 years, it was uh, the idea of a refugee, a person who has lost his home, that, uh, that concerned her the most. And uh, as she had grown up in Aligarh uh, in a conservative Muslim family um, and uh, her great love uh, was Udu poetry and that is how we came close because she realized that in the intervening decades um, um, I had to learn Urdu from my, uh, my school friend Sabdar Hashmi and I could read the script and I was also deeply interested in Urdu poetry. So that was a bond between us and she would send me stuff on email when email came to be and uh, from various poets the poets that uh, uh, remained uh, close to her were the classical poets like Mir Taki Mir and, uh, and Galim. This particular image is a work of hers called Dili. As Ram mentioned she looked at Dili from, from, from the bird's eye view. Uh, from from the sky, as it were. And on the skeletal roadmap of Delhi, she suspends six lines from Mirta Kimir, and the lines read, Kya budo bash pucho ho purab ke saakino, humko garib jaan ke, has has pukar ke, Delhi jo ek shair tha, alam mein in takhaab, rehte ne bal kun tha kapurthi, jaha roz gaar ke, उस उसको फलक ने लूट कह दी वीरा कर दिया हम रहने वाले हैं उसी उजड़े दयार के इन ट्रांसलेशन इट वुड मीन वी मस्ट रिमेंबर दैट मीर लिव्ड इन द मिड मिड 18th सेंचुरी एंड इन 1739 व्हेन नादिर शाह इनवेडेड इंडिया फ्रॉम ईरान दिल्ली वाज डिसरप्टेड Delhi was uh, uh, disrupted twice. It was uh, disrupted in 1739 and then in 1856, and then in 1947, thrice in fact. And Zarina uh, addressed her work to, to, to a Delhi destroyed. So these lines of Mir 
uh, are from a period when Meer had to leave Delhi and seek refuge in Lucknow. And uh, he tells his, um, uh, his friends in the East that, uh, why ask where I come from, O dwellers of the East, knowing of my homelessness, you laugh and you taunt. Delhi that was once a select city in the world, where only the chosen of every trade lived, then heaven saluted it and left it desolate. I am a citizen of that very place. Now, this could be applied to Delhi too, because Delhi, when Zarina returns to Delhi from a post 9 11 New York, uh, uh, you know, she feels that she's going into a place which has been desolated. At least the world that sh she knew, the world, the Delhi that she knew, the language that she spoke in was no longer uh, um, uh, spoken in Delhi. The life that she led was no longer, it was a life led in past. And, um, um, and this idea of melancholy that a lot of Urdu poets um, wallow in uh, lingered in Zarina's, uh, you know, uh, art. Uh, till the end, especially her last few years. She kept returning to the idea of a home that she had lost, of a city that she had lost. And uh, uh, she once quoted a line from Ghalib to me and she said that, um, let's go and live in a place where we know nobody. And if we fall ill, there should be nobody to look after us. And if, they, if I were to die, there should be nobody to sing elegies for me. Uh, uh, that pathos of having lost a world of her childhood, um, you know, became more and more, um, it crystallized as she grew older. Um, what the other thing which again Renu alluded to was that as she grew, uh, entered her last phase, was this idea of a divine light, of noon, uh, as they say in Sufism. And uh, it is to express that divine light and uh, noor that she um, started using gold. And she used it lavishly, um, uh, made screens of gold, made objects of gold, used gold in her paperwork. And uh, uh, especially about uh, the work which is called Blinding Light, which is a large screen um, with slits in it uh, of pure gold. And uh, she said that uh, initially I thought using this much gold in an exhibition might make it garish, but uh, you know, when I think of the story of Moses and the blinding light, um, I had to use gold in this game. And the story that she uh, related to me was that uh, uh, the legend is that Mo Moses asks God to reveal himself. Um, God had warned Moses that, if he, that he would not be able to stand the light of his presence. But Mo Moses insisted. And when God revealed himself, Moses fainted and the surrounding hills and bushes burned. And uh, so, uh, in a way, Zarina has uh, withdrawn into a, into a burning purity, as it were, uh, you know. And uh, I think that would be enough for me to say, uh, Rubina, would you take it on from there? Thank you, Renu and um, Ram and Kali. I think uh, you've covered a lot of ground. Um, I knew of Zarina in the 1990s and occasionally got to see her works. One of this, which Renu mentioned, an exhibition of prints at Galleria Pass, which was my first exposure to her work and in due course saw many other exhibitions and I was fascinated by her work. But I came to know her personally when I was on my Fulbright um, Fellowship at Mills College in California where she was putting up an exhibition of her 10 years, 1990s to 2001, called Mapping a Life, 
which was curated by the provost and the Asian art scholar, Marianne Milford uh, Latsker. And um, Marianne and uh, um, Zarina were friends and um, they came home. And that's how my conversations with Zarina began. And um, we really um, had interesting conversations which revolved around the notion of solitude, the notion of belonging, unbelonging, loss, um, language, etc. And um, my interest in Urdu and uh, Urdu culture and her interest really brought us together. And what was very interesting about that show, this is a picture taken right there in October 2001, when uh, I was assisting her to install these huge installations with the houses and bird-like houses. Um, can I go to the next one? Yeah, for mapping a life, and it was in California. Next, can I go to the next quickly? We landed up talking about uh, language, and uh, it was very interesting. The image that I want to show you after this uh, is from that exhibition, and there were huge crowds that came to see this exhibition, quite intrigued by Zarina's work, trying to position her work, uh, slot in somewhere, where would she fit in, but very intrigued by the Urdu titles in her, ex in her work. And, um, one of the works uh, shows um, a bamboo blind or a dried grass cheek, which you put up in hot summer so that the breeze comes in cool, okay? And Zarina and I were standing in the exhibition and somebody was talking about work in a completely different way. And uh, she was making a comment on um, how uh, things get lost in translation. Okay, how do things get lost in cultural translation? How can this person who's standing here, usko kaise samaj mein aayegi dupair ki dhup? Aur us dhup ke ba dhup mein jo hum blind lagate ya jo cheek lagate the, aur jiske piche se thandi hawa aati thi, jab us gili ghas jab us ghas ko gili karte the, ami, to kitni thandi hawa aati thi. Now this experience or this fragrance of that dried grass being watered and something like that on a long summer afternoon, which is the title of this uh, work. And from there, we had several conversations in translation, which is a very deeply etched memory in my mind because I started looking at her work very differently from there on, uh, not thinking so much about uh, the annals of minimalism or any other formalism or, or, of, of that kind, or what Ram uh, rightly said, abstract but yes in the realm of abstraction how re how really her work uh, uh, fitted in i was also fascinated by the titles of her work and when i came uh, actually um, in fact i uh, uh, i must uh, remember this and uh, quote it here because ram brought this up um, i remember meeting ram in 2002 at zarina's loft which was a gravitating place it was an Eid party and she had invited me because after that we were, uh, we were emailing each other. We were in some conversation and she invited me and my husband and we went there and there was a full house in that loft with Krishna Reddy, Ram Rehman, Meera Nair, Amitav Ghosh. And yes, I also, she particularly took me to meet an African-American artist called Howardina Pindel who was also there that day in that uh, group of uh, people and uh, quite a person, you know, she also was somebody who worked with abstraction and a very strong activist and feminist of a person. And um, in that whole group, it was interesting to see how Zarina was making uh, everybody comfortable and people were just moving around from a studio space into this little loft space and enjoying themselves. Um, I uh, continued this conversation with her and for a very long time wanted to do an exhibition on her. Renu knows about it, how long we have been talking about uh, a, an exhibition at KNMA uh, of uh, Zarina's work. I did not know that this would be the last exhibition of hers, uh, which is now ongoing and it is called Zarina uh, Life in Nine Lines. Um, Three things that really uh, drove me to uh, structure the uh, curatorial part of this exhibition. One was the titles of her works. 
Second is the language Urdu, because she talks about how the text really prompts the image. And third was how she moves from um, making sculptural forms to gradually uh, abstracting her own materiality. And gradually the work becomes more and more uh, minimal and more and more stark and pure, which is the way this exhibition unfolds at KMMA. Uh, for the title parts, I would uh, for the title part, I would like to say, I used to make a note of all her exhibition titles, and I found it very interesting how she started from "Home is a Foreign Place." It is all about home, Aligarh, the house, uh, Baba's house, in, uh, Aligarh, which is the memory that she carries throughout in her life and keeps going back to ref referencing that in different ways and different forms. And um, this repetition, this rhyming, this really uh, uh, obsession with that, you know, seeing it in fragments, seeing it in, in a whole, seeing it fully, drawing it, designing it, planning it, talking about where what was, moving through these spaces, you know, architecturally, topographically, uh, in geometry, in poetry, very interestingly how she really house and there are poems by her where she, where she says that all of us wherever we are dead or alive all of us at night meet in the house at Aligarh you know which is very strongly talking about the bonds and uh, also the law at the same time belonging and unbelonging was always a uh, conflict that went on in hers in the titles it is very interesting when she says that the, she made her life the subject of art. I think that can be traced through her exhibitions as they happened. That can be also traced through her titles of her exhibitions. So if she starts with home is a foreign place and then she goes on to say house on wheels, then it comes to atlas of my world and then it comes to world as home. It literally talks about how she has moved in life how she has really, uh, uh, how she has pondered on the notion of home. Is home a permanent location? Is home a permanent place? What is home? Is it permanent, impermanent? Akhri makam kya hota hai? In Islam, there is a very strong uh, 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 teaching that happens right in the beginning of your life when you're born, that you are here and this is not your permanent place whether you call it home or not, there is some home that eventually you will go. And this makan and makam ke beech mein, jo baat chalti hai, this is what goes on in Zarina's work through and through. And uh, that is very interesting to look at. So when you read her titles, you really find the way she opens up and really she embraced the world as home because she lived in different countries, across continents, across cities, and she has talked about them. She has, in fact, recorded every little place that she lived, okay? Where she, and the idea of house on wheels becomes very potent then. So this motif of home is explored by her in so many different ways. In the exhibition, when you enter, you enter through arches, which are actually uh, uh, taken from a picture of her house. Uh, with arches that I had found. And I have put these arches and from the arches you enter a big screen in the exhibition space which is full of Urdu words without English titles. They are all Urdu words. And if I really, if uh, somebody reads Urdu, they will understand this can be the summary of her life. Because all the kinds of complex emotions, feelings, you know, that she went through, whether the feeling of Deshat, whether the feeling of uh, being alone, loneliness, solitude, ghar, makam, chokhat, uh, uh, ufak, it just goes on, you know. And the way uh, the world and the home interact in that space is very interesting for me. On the one hand, there are fragments and details of home. On the other hand, it is about horizon, stars, seas, uspar, ispar, jo hai, us, beyond stars, jo life hai. it goes on. The thing that I really um, um, got very keen to study and to look into more deeply was her language of form. For instance, it is just like the simple 
simplest or the barest form of geometry, basic shapes, building blocks or bare bones, you know, how she plays with just lines, creates shapes, and the shapes are so elemental, so rudimentary. And it's very interesting, such an elemental, such a um, simple language, but so loaded. It is so loaded completely. Can you just go to the first one? So this is how you enter the exhibition. And uh, my idea was to really look at her sculptural forms because I was very interested in materiality as she talks about it. She always liked to work with fragile materials and really find resilience in them, you know, whether it was paper or it was paper pulp. It was interesting that she talked about the fragility of the material important to her, the rawness of the material that was very important to her. And I think that molding of uh, uh, paper pulp and the cast paper was uh, an interesting exercise that she began, which you see in this room where you have early drawings and a lot of uh, sculptural forms. I was interested because most times there have been fantastic exhibitions of Zarina, but somehow uh, the emphasis on the sculptural forms and the sculptural making of forms uh, with other things perhaps uh, needed to be uh, shown is what I felt. And I really enjoyed, uh, um, thanks Renu for locating many of these works so that they could be shown in this exhibition. Um, next please. This is of course the very famous work uh, Poems I Made, A Life in Nine Lines, from, which is also the title of the work. And uh, this is what I talk, how these elaborate plans come about. And in many of these plans of homes that she lived in, she has actually written, you know, what is where. And that remembrance and experience of living and making those homes is also a very interesting exercise that keeps happening from time to time. But at this time, her memory is clear. She's able to draw these plans out. She's able to spell out uh, Baba's ghar fully in terms of also where was what, where was the garden, where were the flowers, where was the water, where was uh, Amma's room, where was Abba's room, and many of those kinds of details. Next. But then a phase comes gradually where the houses start to become more and more, um, less and less of material and more and more abstraction comes in. And she almost, you can't see these two works, but these two works are like a, like a pattern, like a chatai in which you have to actually find the house. Because the house is just lost in that pattern that she has made. It's like weaving a pattern and then somewhere there is a little house that you can identify. But on both sides what you see, and I really like the fragility of uh, her later works where she cuts out and just completely evacuates all material and it really becomes like a shimmering, a very fragile memory of the house, almost like uh, it's there but not there. You know, literally it's become invisible. It's just a memory of a house that next it gradually translates into something so fragile. These are like really very delicate cutouts uh, of paper, of uh, graphite uh, on paper. And uh, subsequently I found out that many works of this period in 2000 and onwards, she really turns the house or the house is turning into a puzzle. She's writing about how she is now entering the house, but is, cannot exit it, you know? And it's almost like in, in visual terms, the house which was then planned, designed, had structural purity, had structural form, had clarity in terms of how she takes us through, makes us navigate this house, makes us uh, go through its haunted parts, gradually becomes a puzzle. And it's the fading memory, the forgetfulness, the loss of uh, clarity, the house that has been raised down, it's not there anymore. All that coming together and the house then becomes something of this kind. And she calls it the frailest form of house. You know, it has become so frail. That's what has happened to her memory. That membrane is becoming so frail, it's fading. 
and it really takes on in fact there are some more works which i have not put in here but they are in the exhibition where she's literally making making the house breaking it and making it into puzzle form so you really the house convert turns into a puzzle and it's like any one of us you know if we try to remember our grandfather's place or if i try to remember uh, my ancestral graveyard and many such places there are just those little memories or those little uh, little bits that come to your mind and you're trying to put things together and piece them together and that's what uh, you see in zarina in the later works and uh, besides this i think i'll quickly just uh, want to share want to uh, share that um, memories she talks a lot about memories but these memories are very complex in fact i don't think that we can uh, simply slot it as the as the loss of a home i think they become much more complex with her travels they really move spheres in fact i think her works they become extremely political at one level but they are also philosophical they they take on spiritual movings they become very spiritual at at some points and when you read her own writings you realize that that became a way for her to think about so many things you know it is uh, when i look at something like this i feel that the preoccupation and the obsession with the house form could go to such extent that this is a work which is called family portrait and you see an empty frame and you see a thread on which it hangs and what it it says everything i mean it first of all the the empty frame and the uh, the thread makes it a house form again i mean she could see a house anywhere and everywhere literally but the emptiness of the frame also talks about the sense of loss with time you know so the family that was there once the house that was there once is not there anymore and she in fact if you read the letters of rani which are also part of the exhibition which is on at kma uh, she she is rani is writing to her about every death that happens in the family how the father is gone the mother is gone and then asking a question who will go next who knows you know and so that continues you know that kind of conversation about death you know continues and i think that is also the reason why the phase of darkness came so strongly in in her work where she started uh, thinking much more about death okay and i think that is the time when you see when the darkness becomes more intense that is where the noor or the light really becomes visible you know and that's how i would see it i'm not going to touch on all the works that are in the show but uh, some of the interesting things like these little uh, house houses on wheels you know that you see that she makes in a row you know or many of these kinds of uh, sculptural forms you know where she saw a scissor but saw a house in a house in a scissor I mean, these kind of associations that she used to bring in and talk about uh i remember uh, in my personal conversations with her i think we can add on as we go along lovely rubina that was very moving thank you ram rubina what you spoke about the darkness you know and you said about the soul she once mentioned to me uh, we were talking about her work about the material uh, kali you remember that black obsidian the dark night of the soul the diptych what you said now she said to me that i look at both the bright and the and the dark side of a soul she said i'm using this obsidian because it gives that depth it gives that uh, you know that darkness that which is there and that's how she used obsidian i mean every material also what she used yes. it wasn't as if she just used it like that everything was carefully thought about and then selected oh, and, yeah. and the sumi ink which she used and the tasbih she made out of the sumi ink was like you know you just merge into them when you look at it as a viewer and this work i have in which i can't show now what you now said about about houses about angan you know there is a work which is called the echo all around she has i asked her so she said wo awaaz hi goonjti hai wo angan ki so then i asked her the meaning if there was some meaning around that square which she had done on the strips of paper in urdu she said i you know she would not not waste a single little i 
think even a half a centimeter of paper she never wasted. They were all put very neatly mm. in a box, which Yukari, her assistant, would keep. And she would use them as in when she wanted to. So she said to me, So you know what you now said? You know, in the night also she used to get, she used to wake up. Like once she rang me up and said, I was in the night because ideas came, words came, images came. So I wanted to sit and draw So before Yukari comes so that she could paste all what I, what I wanted to do. You know, it was that kind of an, of an uh, passion, that kind of... But you know, one very important thing with Zarina was her love of books. Yeah. yeah. And the whole love of paper actually oh, came yeah. from that love of books. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also the whole notion of printing on paper, you know, when you're talking mm -hmm. about this darkness and the obsidian. That whole idea of using that heavy black ink which sank into the paper yes. was so important to her. You know, it became, it was a kind of material expression of, 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 of an emotion in a very, very deep manner. And it had, and this whole link to the language yes. is also linked to this whole fascination with, you know, the book yes. as an object. Uh, and then, you know, creating different ways of looking at the book when she would make those cast paper pieces and bind them together like a big open the forms also look like calligraphy, you know, scripts yeah. and texts, literally, you know, uh, they would look like puzzles, but they were also like uh, calligraphic forms, which was interesting. In fact, um, she talked about some very difficult uh, feelings and emotions. And at times um, she said that I, I read in one of her books that she used to write that uh, fragrance is very important, you know. And sometimes, you know, when I go back in time and to my house in Aligarh, I used to remember people because of the fragrance they go. Now, how do you really translate this into a work, for instance? You know, so there were these indescribable emotions, indescribable things also, yeah. which, which really she tried to make, make or give, give it a language or give it some kind of an image in some way. And I think that that's, that's where the text became very important. I mean, she, so, she, she always yeah. said that she thought of the word, the word came first and then the oh, image. And yeah. then that processed it, yes. And that's why this exhibition, I have emphasized this whole idea of the word, the and uh, I, I, I don't think I have seen many works where I see poetry and geometry coming yeah. together so beautifully. You know, poetry and geometry really interweave in her work. One without the other is not read yeah. completely. Or, yeah. In fact, at this frailest house which you are showing now, yeah. this was the first work she did mm. of this kind of a drawing plus yes. this cut work. Which she, done. she was on the West Coast for some residency. She had gone for a month or two. And that's when she did, I think, three or four of them. So when I did the show, she said she got this with her on her when she came to India to, for the show. And that's how uh, she said, I really want to put it so special to me. So that's how this work. And there were two or three more. I don't know what happened. She must have given to other galleries. I forgot to ask her. And you see the wonderful thing about Zarina's work, you know, for those of us who can understand the language and understand the... Uh, you know, the connection with the image. Mm. But when you saw the work in Paris or in New York or in Chicago, now people who had no connection to the language, mm. the work, you know, uh, just in its visual purity actually moved people. Yes. They could understand to some extent the depth of what uh, she was talking about, even without, you know, connecting to the uh, elusive and ephemeral use mm. of the words, etc. And, and I think that's something. And I think that's why, her, that's why she got recognized so widely mm. because that work actually spoke. You know, when you're talking about lost in translation, yes. Actually, in many ways, uh, it didn't get lost. Mm. It, it, it got reinvented. But she, 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 she was conscious of the fact that. Um, uh, in the feminist movement, it, what she saw of the black American artists, for yeah. instance, or other artists, it was important to hold your ground. Oh. And for her, it was important to um, uh, 
talk about identity in a very different way, you know, and I think uh, she somewhere in one of my conversations did talk about that. And uh, yes, she, she was very, she, she also had English texts. She had, she also wrote in English. It's not that she only uh, presented her work in, uh, you know, using Urdu couplets or Urdu texts. She did make it a point to really have also her works with English texts or English titles. But I think uh, the cultural specificity at that particular point of time, you know, she did carry with her this idea, you know. And I think, I, I remember as a student, when I was growing up, I was very fascinated by Chagall's story that when he was young, he left the village in Russia and then he grew up in Paris as an artist. And he lived a very long life, 90 plus, God knows. And whenever he was called back to his hometown, his own village, he refused to go. Because he felt that the memories that he carried with him of that place, they would get completely disrupted and they would get completely destroyed if he was to see his native village after 70 years. Wow. Okay. Well, Zarina did go back and she, on her last trip, yeah, she, she took me yes. along with her, in fact, and it was very moving to see her in Aligarh and to visit Saad Ashmi's grave mm. and we had lunch with Irfan Habib, but um, she was very disturbed after that trip. Yes. Subsequently, trips, uh, the subsequent so, trips made, left her very, uh, uh, very angry at times and very pained at times, and she has expressed them. Renu knows about them. Uh, she, you would know uh, how the house had been destroyed and rebuilt, and she was. She, it was. It was very painful for her. When she came, I was back. very disturbed about what uh, the direction that India was taking. You know, especially yeah. after the Babri yeah. Masjid demolition, and then, uh, and of course, nine eleven in New York. Yeah. The whole. Uh, the whole. Uh, Communal in India, the whole the rise of communalism was deeply disturbing to her. Very disturbing. And yeah, it kind of, you know, that whole Nehruvian uh, period that she grew up in and those lovely lives of all these artists who lived in those Barsatis yep. in uh, Nizamuddin yeah, and in Kankura, yeah. etc. Uh, in, in many ways, I actually saw her studio in New York as a, as a Delhi Sat. On 29th Street. So well said. She, car she carried that uh, mm. Ravi Sikri mini boga furniture with her. She carried that Riten Mazumdar cushion covers and bed covers. Um, and it, it really was a Barsati in New York. But it's interesting that she writes about each city, her expression of uh, our experience. And for New York, she writes a space to hide forever. Yes. Yeah. With this we have to, I think it's more than an hour. I yeah. think people will be, I mean, we can keep on talking. Thank you so much, Ram, Kali, Rubina, Thank all friends you. about Zarina. What better mem memory uh, way to celebrate her life and her work? Thank you so much. And Thank please you. keep the exhibition on, Rubina, so we can all see it when we are allowed to move. I, I would like to do that and I think Kiran would also like to do that and hopefully there are a lot of people wanting to see the exhibition. I myself want to spend some time with it. Um, I um, think we will extend it definitely once this lockdown. And um, um, but, um, thank you for a few questions. One, would you like to answer that? If you're aware of this particular one which Tarana Sani has sent, which she's talking about those thousand things, uh, you know, which she had shown, I think, first at the Lurina, she showed on at uh, Veronique. I don't remember because she used to talk to me about it that I'm doing it. Tarana Sani, I don't know where the question has gone. Um, Tarana says a work called uh, 10,000 Things 2016 was shown a few years ago at the Dhaka Art Summit. You know, it traveled. Can you please speak a little about that? Because it seemed almost like it was an archive of a practice. It was actually. That's what she said to me. Any of you aware of that work? Because she said, I'm doing it every day. Those are those small pieces. 2000. Yeah. Uh, which she showed in that circular uh, construction, which was also shown in the Guggenheim. Uh, well, 
in many ways, I think that's a kind of notation. You know, it's like a diary, which yes. is done visually, you know, on a daily basis. And uh, uh, it's all, you know, all her work is, of course, very emotional. And as I said, you know, none of it is actually really abstract because everything is rooted in, in reality, in some reality. And um, I, I think that whole unit, it was, it was kind of an unusual construction for her to do in that elaborate circular manner that you had to walk around. Yes. Uh, it was almost like orbiting, you know, orbiting the sun mm. or a, orbiting a planet that you could see emotional life as you went in this cosmic circle around those objects. Uh, can I share a few of the comments? Everybody is thanking there are lots of people. Wonderful talk. Thank you, all pan panelists. There's one from Uni Karunakara to all panelists. Enduring memories of Zarina. Too many to re recollect. Perhaps the most memorable was accompanying Zarina to the finissage of a paper-like skin show at the Guggenheim. When realized Zarina was the artist, she was mobbed by people from very many nationalities. People who had the same sense of dislocation, displacement and disconnect with from whom. It was an extremely emotional moment and many tears were shed. I was fortunate enough to say, spend an afternoon with Zarina in London. Ten months ago, it was a good day. The sun was shining and her face was lit up with noor. Oh, yeah, Zarina. In fact, I met her in two, last year in June and I'm so happy. I just went for her for two days to spend time with her. And she was so happy to see me and you know, those memories will last in my heart. And um, Tami Mehdi Ratta writes, I think, glad to share with you, I attended the exhibition at the Mills College, Oakland, and attended the opening of an exhibition in San Francisco as well. She was a darling, and her work, minimal in black and white, and stunning. She lived a full life with all limitations, hats off, my Zarina. Love you and bless you. I was at Christie's in New York, where Tayyab Mehta's painting crossed a million dollars. What an evening with Tayyab Sakina, Zarina, and my sweetheart, Ma Maribel. Uh, who was Maribel? When somebody writes to Rubina, um, show Rubina. Just um, to I think for all panelists, Shami again writes, Arena bought her painting worth rupees two thousand from the show of J Swaminathan from my gallery, Chanakya, in nineteen seventy-one. I remember that. You used to sit on her shelf. <laughs> Somebody was congratulating you, uh, Rubina, for your exhibition at KNMA of Zarina's. So, Actually, I told you, Rubina, that uh, Gulam Mohammed Sheikh got so moved by that exhibition that he called me from the show because he got so moved he needed to speak to somebody. And he said I was the only person he could think of, you know, to just just connect, just connect emotionally. And I still haven't seen the show, but I'm, you know, waiting, waiting for this lockdown to end uh, so we can rush over there. There is one Cordula, one killer. I, um, I think she's got some work from us. Thank you very much for this very insightful conversation. It was wonderful listening to your memories and stressing the spiritual travel. She fulfilled so beautiful in her work. So I think with this, we need to say her rights. Thank you, Renu, for the wonderful photograph from New York. Artists in my generation have so much to learn from this spirit of kinship and kindness that she had with everybody. She loved talking to younger artists and younger people. She enjoyed them. Uh, we need to end this. And thank you all. Thank you all the people, everyone, all friends who've joined to listen to our conversation. More so from Rubina when you open your exhibition at the museum. Yes, we look forward. We look forward. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Well, and I hope this is recorded and we can see it later on. It's recorded and everyone can see it. Tell all your friends. Bye. Bye, bye Rubina. Thank you. Bye, Kali. Bye. 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 bye all. And bye the whole team who's helped us put up this whole fabulous presentation. And, and goodbye, Zarina. Thank you, Pardi. Goodbye, Zarina. Oh. And I hope Saima and Imran are listening to it. 
Bye.